In this video, we talked about deep learning. First, we talked about several non-linearities. The first is the sigmoid function. Sigmoid function takes a real value number and returns values in a range between 0 and 1. It has a nice interpretation as the fine rate of a neuron. If it is 0, then it is not firing at all. And if it is 1, then it is fully firing. Sigma neurons saturate and make gradients vanished. The network will not learn. When the neuron's activation is 0 or 1, it saturates. The gradient at the region is almost 0. And almost no signal flows through the waves. If the initial waves are too large, then most neurons would saturate. The second is the time function. The time function takes the real value number and returns a value in the range between negative 1 and 1. Just like sigmoid function, time neurons saturate. However, the output is zero center. And you can consider it is a, a scaled sigmoid function. The next is the ReLU function. It takes a real value number and threshold at zero. And the most uh, deep neural networks use this nonlinearity nowadays because it changes much faster and less expressive operations and also prevents gradient vanishing problems. Given a kernel or filter, for example, a 3 by 3 matrix, each filter is converted to the input matrix or the input uh, patch to compute the dot product between the elements of the filter and the input patch in order to get a two-dimensional activation map of the filter. So if this is an image and putting the kernel at the uh, bottom right corner and compute the uh, dot product of the corresponding elements and we uh, get one value and uh, sliding the filter on the image from left to right and top to the bottom we get um, the output which is a 3 by 3 uh, matrix. And for this, um, at this position, at this position, the convolution actually give uh, four, the convolution of the underlying image patch and the filter uh, uh, gives uh, the value of four. Okay, let's look at um, other uh, parameters. Let's talk about stride and padding. Given a filter or kernel, and this is the filter. The size is three by three, and we apply the kernel on um, the input image. The size of the input image is Phi by phi. Um, what we do here is we pad 
um, the input image by zero. And this is the uh, output uh, image uh, or the um, output map. The size of it can be computed as a function of the input size w. In this case, w is equal to 5. The filter size k, in this case, uh, k is equal to 3. The amount by which the filter shoots, which is the stride s, um, in this case s is equal to 2. So at each uh, position, you compute the uh, convolution and you shift uh, the kernel uh, by 2. And that is the stride s. And 0 padding p P here is 1, because we add uh, uh, 0, outside the uh, uh, region of the image, 1 row, 1 column, on top and uh, bottom, on the left and right. The output size is computed you know, following this formula, which is w minus k plus 2 times p divided by s plus 1. And setting uh, 0 padding to be p equal to k minus 1 divided by 2, when the stride s is equal to 1. That issues the uh, input volume and the output volume are all the same size. For this given example, P is equal to 1, and the size of the output um, is uh, W minus K plus uh, 2P divided by S plus 1, which is 3. Next, uh, we talked about the pooling uh, or subsampling uh, layer. There are several nonlinear functions to implement uh, pooling which may be mice pooling, which is the most common. Some others like average pooling or uh, L2 norm. Mice pooling, basically, you look at uh, uh, each subregion and then take the uh, maximum. So for example, for this subregion, the maximum is six. So we got six. Next, in this uh, subregion, the maximum is 8, so we get 8, and uh, similarly we get 3 and 4. So the intuition is the exact location of a feature is not uh, as important as the uh, location uh, related to other features. And pooling reduces the uh, superficial size of the uh, representation. It reduces the number of uh, parameters and the amount of computation, so control over fitting. And usually, um, a pooling layer is periodically uh, inserted between successive convolution layer layers in. Uh, the architecture. The last layer in the architecture is a fully connected layer or FC. Neurons in an FC layer is connected 
fully to all activations in the previous layers, just like in a regular neural network. And previous layers may include several convolutional and much pooling layers. L2 regularization is a common method that we have been seeing so far. Basically, it penalizes large weights. Drop out is another and which is the most popular regularization technique for deep neural networks. It is used to prevent overfitting, basically by dropping nodes, also uh, connections during training. Each node is retained with a fixed probability p or dropped with the probability 1 minus p. So here p is the hyperparameter to be chosen. Drop connect is the general version of dropout. Basically, each connection can be dropped with a probability 1 minus p. Each neuron receives inputs from a random subset of neurons in the previous layer. And it introduces dynamic sparsity on the width within the model, and this is different from the dropout method. Early stopping in training uses validation error to decide when to stop training. And basically, when some monitor quantity has not improved after and subsequent epochs, then stop. What is an autoencoder used for? An autoencoder is used for unsupervised learning, basically without uh, the support of labels. It is a network that learns an efficient coding of the input. Uh, here we have the model, which is changed to predict its own input and mapping it through a representation created by the hidden units of the network. Usually the number of hidden units is much fewer than the number of inputs or outputs. Let's look at this example. In the churning um, uh, step, the data is passed through the network and compressed at the hidden layer. And later, reconstructed at the output layer. After churning, if we remove the output layer, what we have left is the compact representation of the inputs provided by the hidden layer. Autoencoders can be stacked on top of each other, and here we call them stacked autoencoders. So let's say if we have this autoencoder. After the tuning, we remove the output layer. What we have left is just this including the input and the hidden layers. And then we put another layer, another autoencoder on top of it. This is existing layers. And then we put a hidden layer and an output layer on top of it. And after tuning, we remove the output layer. And what we have left is just this, which is the uh, stacked autoencoder.